Hey guys, my name's Sid. If you lived in my neighborhood when I was a kid, you might know me as the bad boy. The one who wore a skull t-shirt and the one with the ferocious killer dog. But all stories have two versions. Only no one ever wanted to hear mine. Actually, I was always a very good boy. Yes, I always fought with my sister, sometimes through tantrums in the street, but what kid doesn't do that? My t-shirt was because I liked rock music, and my haircut was because my family didn't have money to send me to a hairdresser, so they cut it for me. People at school treated me very badly because of my appearance. It was like they were afraid of me. I tried to make friends many times, but everyone always stayed away from me. Luckily, I had one best friend who never judged me and was always by my side. My dog. My parents were hardly ever in the house, so Scud was the only one who kept me company every day. Anyway, he had a good time at my house. I always played with my toys. When I grew up, I wanted to be a doctor, so I used to do surgeries with my toys, fusing them and experimenting with them. I felt pity when I broke them. But once, my mom told me that they don't feel pain, so from that day on, I didn't mind breaking them, since that would be a good excuse to try to repair them. Despite my family's situation, everything was going very well, but one fateful day, everything would change. One day, I was with a new toy I had found. It was a Buzz Lightyear, just like the one on TV. I was ready to launch it into space where it belonged, but something incredible happened. The toys in my house came to life. They were everywhere. In the mud, in the sandbox. They were all getting up and walking towards me, like zombies. At that moment, Woody, another one of my new toys, stared at me with a terrified look on his face and told me that toys have lives and that if I ever hurt them again, they'll kill me. I never saw Buzz or Woody again, but from that day on, I am terrified of toys and they know it. From that day on, being in my house became a nightmare. Every time I went into my room, all my toys were arranged differently. I tried to throw them away, but they always came back. Sometimes they'd be waiting for me perfectly arranged with signs telling me to play with them. Crying, I obeyed them. Who knows what would happen to me if I didn't. Anyway, I didn't even pay attention to them. In any case, not even listening to them and everything they asked me to do would prevent what happened on the worst night, the night I was almost killed. That night, I had gone to bed very early, as we had an evaluation and I was fatigued. I fell asleep almost instantly, and although I thought I would wake up many hours later, a few minutes later, I was already with my eyes open. What? What's happening? They were my three toys. Babyface, Legs, and Ducky. The last one had a piece of paper cut in its hand, which had written on it, You are not playing with us anymore. I'm... I'm sorry. I promise I'll do it more often. Why do we always have to ask you? Please, don't hurt me. I'm really trying my best. You've been a very bad boy, Sid. Now, we'll have to hurt you. No! Please, no! I'll do anything you ask! Don't do anything to me! Ignoring my words, Ducky grabbed one of my eyelids with its huge toy hands and lifted it up, to which Legs, who climbed up to my forehead, used its fishing rod to catch it and leave it open. Luckily for me, its hook was made of plastic, so it didn't hurt, but that wasn't its purpose. Other toys began to climb up on my belly with a small mirror, and at the command of Babyface's paws, they put it near my eye. I didn't understand what they were doing, but when I saw them carefully arrange it, I understood everything. Ah! Help! My eyes! It burns! After several seconds of screaming and pain, they did the same to the other eye. After a few seconds, they stopped. My eye felt like it was burning. I couldn't see anything at all. When they stopped, I felt something strange. While I was screaming, toy soldiers came into my mouth. I tried to close it, but Babyface used its claws to leave it open, while with its head it mocked me. Already inside my mouth, a few soldiers ran towards my throat. I started, 
Were they trying to kill me? Had I hurt them so much that they hated me so much? I felt like fainting, but hearing all the screams. And to my rescue, my dog ran into my bed. And when it jumped on top of me to attack the toys as it always does, the bed gave up and broke, allowing me to break free. I coughed up all the soldiers and desperately ran out of my room, but I still couldn't see anything. I crashed into everything in front of me until, as soon as I managed to get out of the room, I fell down the stairs. Already on the floor, I felt that my body was not reacting. I couldn't feel my arms or my legs. Possibly I had broken them. I opened my eyes slowly, trying to clear my vision. Babyface was in my face, looking at me with that terrifying baby smile. I felt his paws sinking into my nostrils, squeezing harder and harder inside. I wanted to scream. I wanted to call for help. But I was so shocked. I could only watch with my eyes wide open. With no one to save me, assuming Babyface was going to bury its claws all the way into my brain, the toy simply stopped. We will kill your sister. We will kill your family. We will kill your dog. Play with us. With that said, the toy simply fell to the floor as if it had no life. Behind me, I heard two worried voices. Sid, what happened to you? Son, are you okay? It was my parents. Both of them had brought my sister from a friend's house. Damn it, son, look at your shoulder, you've dislocated it. Confused, I couldn't answer anything. I just looked at them, and crying, I hugged them. Wow, you really got hit hard, didn't you? When we went to the hospital, they only told me I had a dislocated arm and some bruises. When I got home, I went to my room. All the toys were leaning on the bed with a sign that said, We love you, Sid. It took me days to see well again, and I still don't think part of my eyes ever healed. From that day on, I played with my toys every day until the day I moved out of my house. All of my aspirations of becoming a doctor vanished. Today, I work as a garbage collector. I enjoy my job, but every once in a while, when I throw everything in the dumpster, sometimes I see toys in the garbage, and I swear they're looking at me too. Andy's best friend in the Toy Story movies is his cowboy doll Woody, but a theory posits that Woody first belonged to Andy's absent father. Being one of the most discussed conspiracy theories, many fans came up with various interpretations of this. Some say Woody himself was Andy's father, and somehow his dead father remained alive through his childhood doll, but Toy Story never directly addressed the big question. What exactly happened to Andy's father? Did he die? Did he and Andy's mom get a divorce? The story you're about to see is a spin-off sequel created by IMR, just for your entertainment. Being one of the biggest fans of the Toy Story franchise, IMR took the liberty to produce the comic storyline with a creative dark turn. Hope you all will enjoy it. Ah! Where the hell is my beer? I asked for it an hour ago! Get it yourself. Andy? Andy! Where is that stupid boy? Always keeping his toys scattered around the floor? Andy! I casually walked downstairs. This was something new for me. Since my mom married her abusive boyfriend, our lives had finally become completely unbearable. Frank's abuses have two levels. At first, he abuses alcohol, and then he abuses us. Pretty simple, but highly effective. As I came downstairs, I saw my mom staring at me with utmost annoyance and anger. How many times do I have to tell you to throw out this old junk? One day, it's gonna ruin our lives. She has always been so dramatic about everything. I kept quiet like I do these days and started picking up my toys into a cardboard box. Frank stormed to the fridge to get himself a beer while my mom went to the kitchen cursing her life. On his way back to the porch, Frank stopped beside me. I was about to pick up the last toy, and he happily put his huge feet on my hand. <laughs> Look at you. Filthy, measurable squint. It was painful, but I kept quiet like I do these days. 
After a few seconds, he let go and went back to his dirty, fart-smelling couch, back to watching TV. I grabbed the box filled with toys and came back to my room. I opened my closet to keep the toys. I was almost done putting all of them when I found a Sheriff Cowboy toy. I had no idea how it ended up in my box, so I picked it up and pulled the string attached to its back. Giddy up, partner! Wow, it talks! I pulled the string a few more times and it said a bunch of catchphrases like, Reach for the sky! You're my favorite deputy! The toy's clothes were old and had dirt on them. I took it to the bathroom and cleaned its shirt. I slept hugging it that night. For the first time in a while, I missed my dad. I hardly think about him. He died when I was a little kid. Tears rolled down my eyes as I thought about him. I looked at the cowboy doll. I wish you could come alive. It was probably around 1 a.m. when I woke up hearing my mom's painful sobbing. No, Frank, please. Just leave me, okay? I don't want to be with you anymore. I realized drunk Frank is again beating my mom. I came downstairs and found my mom on the ground. Her lips were bleeding, probably from a punch or a slap, and Frank was standing next to her with his leather belt in one hand. Leave you? After how you ruined my life? You said your husband left tons of money for us! That's why I came here! And now you tell me all that money belongs to your little piglet son? You witch! I'll... Don't you dare touch my mom, Frank! My, my. The little piglet talked. <laughs> now I will skin both of you alive. Saying this, he snapped the belt in my direction, and just then an unexpected sound took place. There's a snake in my boot. What the hell is this? I don't know how my cowboy doll ended up on the living room floor. Frank's accidental stepping over him made it talk. <sighs> what a hecked up family is this? He raised his leg to stomp on my doll in anger. I lunged at him, screaming. No! Leave him alone! But he pushed me away and I fell on the floor. Frank then went on stomping over the doll and screaming in joy. <laughs> there goes your ragged puppet! I'll do the same thing to you too! The doll was getting smashed, but then suddenly Frank stopped. He grabbed his chest and fell on the floor like he was having a heart attack. No! Frank! My mom screamed. Frank's body started shaking and his skin swelled up. Thousands of blisters started popping on his face, arms, every inch of his body. He looked like a man built with transparent water balloons. Slowly, he blew up into a big barrage balloon. In a choked up dying voice, he said, What's happening to me? And then a loud sound of pop took place. Frank popped and his skin fell on the floor along with his clothes. My mom and I were too stunned to speak. What did you do to him, Andy? What? I didn't do anything. What are you saying? Where did you find this doll? I remember burning it with the other stuff. What other stuff? What are you saying? This can't be. This isn't possible. He's dead. I saw my mom turning hysteric. I was shocked to see that the doll's appearance scared her more than what just happened to Frank. Her words made no sense. I couldn't take it anymore. I screamed. Please tell me what's going on here. You're being crazy. It belonged to your dad. Okay? Happy? I couldn't bear the sight of his things. They all reminded me of your father, Andy. So I burned them. I burnt everything that belonged to your dad. And I burned Woody too. Then how the hell is he back? Dad called him Woody? I will burn this again. Yes, right now. But before she could, Frank's leftovers started moving. Something was under all that skin and clothes. The pile started to rise like a wave on the ocean. Slowly, a skinny pair of legs wearing boots peeked out from that pile. One by one, the hands, the upper torso, and a face with a sheriff hat on it hovered from that pile. My small cowboy doll 
Woody was now standing in front of our eyes in his human size. A sick smile was lurking on his face. He looked my mom in the eye and said, Being there for a child is the most noble thing a toy can do. Oh my god, this isn't real. <laughs> this is the perfect time to panic. And he picked up Frank's belt and started chasing my mom around the house. Time to straighten things up. My mom ran to save her life, and Woody didn't let her breathe for one second. There came a point when she collapsed on the ground and started panting, and the final truth came out of her mouth. I'm sorry, okay? I... I admit it. I killed him. Yes, it was me. I poisoned him every single day for his money. But please, please let me go. You killed my dad? You killed that one person who loved me? Fury and heartbreak took over me. I looked at Woody. He had the biggest grin ever. He slowly walked up to my mom and then gave her a tight hug. He hugged her so tight that my mom's face smashed like a jelly bean. But instead of blood or fluid, cotton balls came out of her mouth. Strings of thread rolled down from her eyes. And then, an explosion of puffy cotton balls took place, leaving her skin and clothes on the ground. Like Frank, she was gone too. I finally have peace in my life now. Woody and his new girlfriend take good care of me. We call her Bo Peep. Both of them look odd in their human-sized physic, but I don't ever want to be away from them. It's like having my perfect parents again. Over the years, the Toy Story franchise has been subject to all manner of fan theories. From how the toys are living creatures, to Andy's mother being the real villain. A reoccurring theme throughout the Toy Story movies is the toy's fear of not being loved or played with. Based on that note, some fans even claim that the toys from Toy Story are vampires and they are immortal. To succumb to their immortal life, the toys feed on children's joy instead of blood. And maybe because Andy's mother could sense this evil intention among the toys, she was so adamant to get rid of them. However, these are just theories developed by fans. IMR Scary Tales thought to go creative by giving this theory a dark yet entertaining touch. Enjoy. My daughter Chrissy used to be a huge fan of Toy Story when she was five years old. She was obsessed with the weird mutant toys, and among them... The baby face was her favorite. As creepy as it sounds, it was true. Kids sometimes fancy weird things that make no sense to grown-ups. She would beg me to buy her the baby face toy, but I didn't because of its scary attire. One day, I was cleaning the house when I heard my husband talking to Chrissy in a hush-hush voice. Now, don't tell mom, okay? She would be angry if she knew I made this for you. I love you, Dad. This is exactly what I wanted. I went to Chrissy's room and saw my husband, Daniel, giving a box to Chrissy. What are you guys up to? What's in that box, Daniel? Um, uh, nothing. Chrissy came running up to me and said, Dad made me the baby face toy. Please, Mommy, can I keep it? Please. I opened the box and saw my nightmare turned into reality. Daniel is an engineer and somehow... He has built the creepy baby face toy from Toy Story for our daughter. He let out an awkward chuckle and said, <laughs> Chrissy's been asking for it for a long time, Mindy. It's just a toy after all. But how come this doesn't freak out, you guys? I don't think any kid should play with something like this. But mommy, it walks! Chrissy placed the toy on the floor and turned on a small switch at the back of his bulbous head. Balancing on its metallic spider legs, the head of another broken doll started walking all over Chrissy's room. God, this looks sick. Come on, Mindy, you're overreacting now. What harm can come from playing with a toy? Fine, you can keep it. Oh, my sweet mommy. Chrissy hugged me and got super excited about finally having the toy of her dreams. The entire day, Chrissy didn't let Babyface go out of her sight. Even at the dinner table... I had to tolerate that creepy doll staring at me. After dinner, I got busy doing the dishes and cleaning the kitchen. 
The house was in deep silence as everyone slept in their rooms. Before going to bed, I thought of checking on my daughter. I walked into her room, trying my best not to wake her up. Chrissy was sleeping like a little lamb, and beside her laid Babyface, with one broken eye and its outrageous metallic legs. This was my chance. I picked it up to throw it in the bin, and to my surprise, Chrissy opened her eyes. What are you doing with Babyface? Um, nothing, just keeping it on the shelf. You lie! You were gonna throw him away! No, why would you think that, Chrissy? He just told me. He heard your heart. A cold shiver ran down my spine. Just then, I felt a sharp pain on my finger like a giant bee stung me, and I dropped the toy on the floor. You've made him angry. Now, he is going to punish you, mummy. What? What are you... Suddenly... A sound of crackling bones shifted my attention from Chrissy to Babyface. The toy was now standing on its spidey legs and looking at me with a creepy smile. I could see the evil in its eye. Within a second, it started to crawl at me at full speed. It jumped on me, and I screamed and kicked it with all of my strength. The toy flew in the air for a moment and hit the wall. Its creepy metal legs broke like shattered glass and I sat down on the floor. I was panting. I thought, finally it was over. The damned cursed toy is dead now. But my relief didn't last long. As soon as the toy broke, something horrible happened. Thousands of small baby-faced toys started coming out of its big bulbous head. Yes, an army of baby faces filled Chrissy's room. (laughs) Get mommy, go, get her! Chrissy started clapping and laughing, seeing these monsters attack me. Before I could get up and run, they were all over my body like a herd of spiders. They were crawling everywhere. On my hands, my legs, my hair, my face, even got inside my clothes. Their tiny metal legs pierced through my skin. I was getting injected with a thousand needles at the same time. Ah, Save me! Save me! Daniel! Help me! Ah! No matter how hard I tried to get the creepy crawlers away from me, more and more of them started coming at me. I thought this was it. I will be eaten alive by these baby faces. Somehow, somehow they all came alive and sensed my hatred for them. Oh God, if I knew how vengeful and dangerous they are, I would have never pissed them off. I would have loved them and feared them just like Chrissy. Please, if I could only have one more chance, I swear I will be their mother too. But I guess it's too late now. I was drowning in a swarm of baby faces. They were laughing like baby vampires. The cuts they made on my body, I could feel them sucking my blood from those wounds. As they drank my blood, their heads turned red. I was in hell and no one came to my rescue. Slowly, the will to live started dying in my heart. (laughs) This is what you deserve, Mommy. This is what happens when you hate Babyface. Chrissy mocked me sitting on her bed. I couldn't believe my daughter was against me. Slowly, her face started changing into the creepy toy. My beautiful daughter's head got replaced by the one-eyed, broken doll head. I couldn't take it anymore. Not my daughter! I shook my body with all my strength, and the crawling toys deflected. Once I freed myself from their grasp, I lunged at Chrissy, who wasn't my daughter anymore. I grabbed the bulbous head and started smashing it into the wall. You took my daughter! I will kill you! I will kill you! You cursed doll! This will be the end of you! Die! 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 I went on smashing the doll's head on the wall. I didn't stop. Didn't hesitate. Just kept screaming. Die! 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 Mindy! What did you do? It was Daniel's voice that brought me back to this world. I wanted to tell him. I killed Babyface. 
We finally got rid of this haunted toy, but then I noticed my hands. To my horror, they were drenched in blood. Human blood. As I looked at my daughter's bed, the ground beneath my feet swept away. All hell broke loose. It wasn't a baby face whom I thought I was smashing into the wall. The wall had blood stains, and fresh blood was dripping down it. Chrissy's lifeless little head hung from the edge of the bed, and I realized what the toy made me do. It made me kill my daughter. There were no swarms of small baby faces, as if there never were. Only the baby face toy that my husband made for Chrissy was lying broken in the corner. Oh my god, is that her? Yeah, Mindy William, the mother who smashed her daughter's head to a pulp. Some people say she got possessed by a demon. That's... She's a psycho. She did it with her sane mind. There's no demon behind this crime. This happened when I was in college. I was 20 at the time, studying for an upcoming exam in biology. That is, until my roommate busted in my room. She wasn't yelling, but I could see she was drunk by her excitement. I rolled my eyes and sighed. I completely lost focus now. But it was okay. I kind of gotten used to her behavior. She was a party girl while I was, well, a nerd. I tried to get back on my reading tracks again, but she patted me on the back and drunkenly giggled before speaking. Come on, Jasmine. Every time I see you, you're always reading a book. I sighed before speaking. And every time I see you, you smell of alcohol and vomit. She frowned at me. How about this? I'll be quiet all week if you come to this party tomorrow at 8. I wanted to say no, but then I thought about it. I mean... I do always work really hard. Besides, she won't barge in like this for the whole week? Sounds too good, I thought to myself, so I nodded and continued to read. We got ready. I hadn't dressed up in ages, so I was kind of excited. The party was loud, filled with drunk people making out, bumping and dancing. The party was hosted in a basement-like setting, only it was much bigger and had a lot of space. I'm not going to lie, I did have a few drinks. I wasn't drunk, but I was definitely tipsy. So, as my view became tilted, this guy comes out of nowhere and has small talk with me. He was fairly attractive. He didn't seem drunk. We met and exchanged names. From what I remember, he had red dyed hair and blue eyes. He was white and about six feet. His name was Luke. We laughed and talked about topics like studying and books and that kind of thing. The talking went on for about a half an hour. He then said, Hey, I'm going to get another drink. Want anything? And I said, why not? I mean, I'm having fun. So later on, he came back with drinks. And the next thing I remember, we were making out in the corner of the party room. It was so quick. And then he asked me, Want to go back to my place? Which I politely declined. I already know what he wants. Besides, I needed to be on campus in the morning. Come on, I promise it will be fun. I remember that he kept on trying to get me to go, but he gave up after I made it clear I wasn't interested in going to his place. He rolled his eyes angrily and gave me a paper with a number on it. Fine. If you change your mind, give me a call. He leaned close to me and whispered against my ear. Then he walked out, and the rest of the night was a complete blank. The next day, I woke up inside my college bedroom, on my bed, next to my roommate snoring on her bed as well. As I got up to shower, a paper fell out of my pocket. It was the number, which made me remember that guy. But I had more important things now. I showered then and went to study. I remember reading my book when all of a sudden, I felt dizzy. Then I woke up in the bed with police officers and nurses talking next to me. Turns out, I had this dangerous allergic reaction that could only be caused from saliva or any bodily fluids that had come from decaying or rotting flesh. Which to my surprise, was weird. I hadn't been kissing anyone, let alone ate anything raw. Then I remembered the guy. 
I told the police about the guy at the party and gave them the number he gave me. A few weeks passed and my allergies went down so I could live my life normally. I just finished my test when my phone rang. I answered it and it was the police. Turns out the guy from the party had two dead decaying women's bodies inside his apartment that he ate. They must have been there for months. My heart dropped. The thought that I made out was someone who ate human flesh. Or even worse, was what if I had agreed to come to his place? I may have been one of those bodies. When I was in the seventh grade, I heard about astral projection for the first time and thought the idea seemed pretty cool. Who wouldn't want an out-of-body experience and travel around the world? Anyways, I've been attempting it for several months to no avail. I did doubt it wasn't real and eventually stopped attempting it. Then one day on a January, I decided to hit the bed at around 7 p.m. to take a nap and the next second I began to feel I was being pulled out of my body as a strong vibration feeling overcame me, similar to that body feeling you get from a strong nicotine rush. I then was floating in my room and felt a presence right behind me, but didn't think much of it. It wasn't a good presence, more of a demonic one. Despite there being my family in the home awake, I didn't see anyone there, and only the light that illuminated the stairway was on. Everything also had a blue tint to it, and I could see clearly in the dark. I had to swim through the air to be able to move and went through my door and swam my way downstairs. I decided to go up and through the ceiling and then through the roof and explore this new plane of existence. However, as I went through the ceiling, I saw this creature rushing towards the stairs and it stopped as soon as I stopped moving to see it. I could only see the back of it from the right side of it since it was blocked by a wall but it had yellow skin, pointy, elongated ears, a tail that's medium-sized, and it appeared to be as tall as I was at the time, 5'6". I stared at it for a few seconds, frozen in fear, and before I knew it, I was awake, back in my bed. I looked at my clock and several minutes had passed by. I don't know what to think of that, but it was an interesting experience. <laughs> When I was eight years old, I didn't have any friends. My mom wouldn't allow me to play outside with the other kids in our neighborhood. I was always alone. The only playmates I had were my cousins and my brother, but it took three hours and 25 minutes to get to their houses. One day, my mom let me play outside with the kids in our neighborhood for the first time because she was going somewhere, maybe to work or to run errands. I got my dolls and other toys and was excited to play with the kids outside. When I got there, no one wanted to play with me. The attempt was useless, but then someone approached me. He had puppy eyes and was cute. We quickly became playmates. Even though he was a boy, he would join me for tea parties with my dolls. He also invited me to play with him at his house, but I was confused because his house looked old and abandoned. Like it hadn't been cleaned up for almost 12 years. We decided to go play in his garden. When we got there, I puked. I didn't know why at the time, but for some reason, I was disgusted. He didn't offer me water or anything. He just looked at me grinning and said, next time you're going to sleep here too. Two weeks after that upsetting experience, I went looking for him. A paper airplane flew to me out of nowhere. I picked it up and when I opened it, I was shocked, scared, and sad. It was a newspaper clipping. The boy that I played with went missing nine years ago. I ran to my bedroom and I saw a shadow through my window. I looked at it closely and it was the boy. He was smiling. Today, I'm 19 years old and I still remember that part of my childhood so clearly. One day, when I was about six or seven years old, my mom had gone to my older sister's recital in Georgia, and my dad was at work. He was a pilot for some airline. So she left me and my older brother, 
who was only 12 at the time, at the sitter's house, which was a few blocks away from my house. My sitter, who I'm going to call Bev, was 19, and she was pretty much the best kind of sitter to a 6-7 to seven year old boy could ask for. She'd let us play games and stay up watching TV, as long as we didn't bother her while she was on the phone with her boyfriend. We were watching TV, and we could hear something scratching the paneling on the side of the house. Naturally, we blew it off as a stray animal, so we continued watching TV. About 30 minutes to an hour later, Bev ran into the living room and locked the front door and shut the blinds. We were curious as to what she was doing. Me and my brother, being kids, got scared and started crying. Then Bev said everything would be okay. It was just a peeping Tom. So she took us upstairs and we went to her parents' room with the Nintendo and some snacks. She said stay put and not to touch anything we didn't bring into the room. Not a minute later after she walked out of the room, we heard a loud crash and glass shattering in the room below us. The sicko had thrown a brick from the walkway through the guest bedroom window and managed to get in. I remember Bev running into the room and pulling us into the closet and telling us we were going to play a game of hide-and-seek and to be very quiet. She got out of the closet and locked it from the outside latch and disappeared. Several minutes passed and we could hear a grown man screaming, Come out, come out wherever you are. I only want to play. Then I heard what sounded like water running in the bathroom across from the closet. Then it shut off. And I heard Bev yelling something at the man. It was something like, The police are on their way. You better get out of my fucking house now. Then we could hear loud, heavy footsteps sprinting out of the room, and then sirens wailing in the distance. Bev shrieked, and we heard a loud thud on the ground below us. Bev had managed to find an old wooden bat. As the man turned a corner to go out the front door, Bev swung the bat as hard as she could, knocking the man to the floor. Dazed, he got up and tried chasing her outside. But the cops had already arrived and tackled the man on sight. My mom came home immediately and took me, my brother, and Bev back to my house. A few years later, she explained that the man was a known sex offender and had escaped from prison. In the report, he was said to be carrying a rather large knife in his pocket and had a Saturday night special tucked away in the waist of his pants. It happened last year, 2018, when I was still in my second year of high school. It was earlier March that I was in school. We were just playing some quiz game on my laptop. I connected it to the projector for all of them to see. But then suddenly, the school's fire alarm went off. They said this isn't a drill, but rather a maniac just entered our school with a gun. So all of us closed the door and the window to our classroom and switched off the lights. It was all silent like you could hear a pin drop to the floor. At first, I wasn't panicking that much, but it all started to happen when a gunshot was heard from the distance of our room. I can assume that he already knows that we're here. We are the closest room from the entry hall. Every single one of my classmates was crying. I'm the tallest and the oldest student of them all. I'm 16 and some of them are 15 and 14 and another one is 12. So I thought, I'm the oldest. I should protect them. And I was like that. So then I grabbed the fire extinguisher in our room because every single room in my school has a fire blanket and a fire extinguisher just in case of a fire. I had a stupid plan inside my head that I'll spray him with the fire extinguisher. So then I opened our room door and I came across it. He was a middle-aged man wearing a white tank and black slacks. He was holding a 44 Magnum caliber revolver at first, we were having a quick draw match, like that. He grabbed his gun first and pulls the trigger. I can feel my heart beating fast, and just then he aimed the gun at me, but it didn't shoot at all. He forgot to cock his gun, so then it's my chance to hit him with a fire extinguisher and knock him out. 
After that, the police arrived and every student was reunited with their family. And still, I'm wondering, what could have happened if he didn't forget to cock his gun and shoot me first? My name is Magda, and I'm 26 years old. I work in an office in the city. On the weekends, I used to love to get away from all the hustle and bustle and take a trip to the countryside. Luckily, I have a cottage in a small village which is located right at the edge of the forest. How I used to love to get out of the city and spend the weekend in my little cottage. Why did I stop? Well, I'll tell you. After a hard week at work, I needed to rest, so I decided to get out of town. I went home, packed my bags, threw them in the trunk, and drove off. When I arrived in the village, it was late in the evening and I was tired from the long drive. I went straight to bed and fell asleep quickly. In the middle of the night, I was awakened by the sound of my car alarm going off. I looked out the window, but there was nobody in sight. I found my car keys, pressed the button to shut off the alarm, and the awful noise stopped. I laid back down and tried to fall asleep. All of a sudden, the alarm went off again. I didn't feel like getting up, so I just grabbed my keys and pressed the button once more. Everything was peaceful and quiet again. However, five minutes later, the alarm went off a third time. Once or twice could have been an accident, but now I was wondering what was going on. Could someone be playing tricks on me in the middle of the night? I got up again and pressed the button to turn off the alarm, but this time, I didn't lay back down. I stood at the curtains and watched. After a few minutes, I saw something by the light of the moon. A shadow emerged from the bushes and slowly approached the car. I could just about make out the shape. It was something tall, skinny, and black. The figure reached out with its long, thin arms and knocked on the car. The alarm went off again, and quick as a flash, the dark figure retreated back into the bushes. At that moment, I realized what was going on and began shaking with fear. I turned off the alarm and continued to watch. The thing emerged from the bushes again, slid silently over to the gates, threw a hand through them, and removed the partition holding the gates closed. I was paralyzed with fear, and I couldn't move. My mind was overcome by panic thoughts. What was it? What did it want from me? What was it doing? Would it ever go away? A shiver ran through my body, from my head down to my toes. My mouth was dry and my heart was beating fast. I was so tense, I was gritting my teeth and clenching my hands into fists. I regained control of myself and ran down the stairs as fast as my legs could carry me to the ground floor. I wanted to look for something I could use to protect myself. However, just as I was about to switch on the lights, I suddenly froze in my tracks. The dark figure was at the window. It was pressed up against the glass, staring in, looking to see whether or not there was someone home. I immediately ducked down behind the sofa and peered out. And that's when I realized what all those tricks with the car were for. It was trying to lure its victim outside. I couldn't take my eyes off its hideous face. Its skin was the color of ash and covered with wrinkles. Its eyes were small, beady, and completely black. Instead of it having a nose, there were two ragged holes. It didn't have any lips, just two rows of sharp, yellow teeth. When it breathed, it was so heavy and hoarse that it was misting up the window. I just knew it wasn't going to go away. After standing at the window for a few moments, I heard a rustling noise as it came to the front door. I watched as it tried to push its fingers through the gap under the door. The handle began to twitch wildly up and down. The creature emitted a chilling sound. It was not like a human voice. It was a deep, beastly growl, like an angry dog chewing on a bone. I knew that if it heard me, it would keep trying until it found a way to get into the house. I crouched down behind the sofa, hiding in the shadows and desperately trying not to make a sound. 
tears began involuntarily streaming down my face, no matter how much I tried to stop them. I could feel my pulse pounding in my temples, and I was shaking like a leaf, just waiting for it to end. I don't know how long I cowered there. I must have been passed out. When I woke up and looked out the window, the creature was gone. The door was still in place, and everything seemed secure. I've never been so relieved in all my life. I ran upstairs and looked out the window. It was light outside, and there was no sign of anything wrong. Taking a chance, I grabbed my keys, and without stopping to collect any of my things, I ran out to the car. I jumped in, locked the doors, and drove away from the village as fast as I could. I didn't stop driving until I got back to the city. When I got back to my apartment, I turned on the radio and heard a news report. The announcer said that, in the village, the dead bodies of two girls had been discovered. Their corpses had been mutilated and dumped in a swamp. I guess the creature found what it was looking for. I don't want to, but I am curious to know. What would have happened if I didn't make the right decision of sprinting? Years ago when I was in the fifth grade, my friends and I were walking home from school when we noticed some of the other kids laughing very loudly at something and running away like they were disgusted. We looked back and they were laughing at this woman who was walking behind us. We didn't know why because we saw her every day when we were walking home from school. We just never spoke with her or we, we never even seen her up close. We moved closer to see what was so funny and we definitely noticed what the other kids were making ruckus about. This was a man dressed in a mini skirt with high heels on. The other kids were throwing sticks and rocks at it but he never responded, he just smiled while he was walking. A few days later, I just so happened to be watching the news and I saw the same guy's face on the news. My friend who lives around the corner was getting her mail when she saw the man across the street watching her. He waved and he started skipping across the street like a little girl while loudly asking her, do you remember me? She was one of the kids that threw rocks at him. She shut her door as he started running full speed toward her house while wearing a wig, mini skirt, heels, and a woman's tank top. He started banging on her door until she called the police. He was caught within minutes. Anything could have happened to us that day with this guy roaming our neighborhood. But luckily, nothing ever happened to any of the kids that I knew. This story happened when I was 18 years old and a senior in high school. It was an ordinary night. My dad worked the night shift, so we all decided to sleep in my parents' room. I was with my younger brother, who was 15 years old at the time, my younger sister, who was 11 years old, and my mom. My parents' room was a small, purple, square-shaped room, which also had a bathroom. The bathroom's door was across from the bed. My younger brother and I slept on my parents' bed while my mom and my younger sister slept on the floor. Before sleeping, we all had a short conversation, and after that, we went to sleep at 9 p.m. At 2 a.m., I was awakened by a strange sensation. As I opened my eyes, I had my eyes fixed on the bathroom door, which was cracked open. To my surprise, I noticed a black figure, which looked exactly like my younger brother. The figure stood there with his arms crossed, watching me. However, his eyes were shut. At that moment, I froze. I couldn't move from the bed and I was scared that if he opened his eyes, he would have red or bloodshot eyes. I decided to quietly turn my head to the other side of the bed to see if it was indeed my brother. My heart sunk to my stomach when I realized that my brother was sleeping right next to me. So many thoughts kept racing through my head. Who is this person? Why is he here? How could he look exactly like my brother? I tried as hard as possible to sleep and ignore what I saw. A few minutes later, after opening and closing my eyes, I was shocked to see that the figure was now standing above me, still looking right into my eyes with his eyes shut. My eyes were wide open from the shock. I felt like I was going to die from a heart attack. I felt as if he was starting to open his eyes, which scared me and caused me to close my eyes and force myself to sleep. 
forcing myself to sleep worked, and the next thing I knew, it was morning. When I woke up, I headed to the living room and saw my mom. After holding it inside for a bit, I gave up and told my mom about the incident. I almost froze when she said she saw the same exact figure and witnessed what happened. It was terrifying. We both saw the same black figure that looked exactly like my brother. It was as if he was my brother's twin. We lived in that house for two more years until we finally moved out. After the move, we told my dad about this story because he doesn't like hearing creepy stories, so we kept it a secret until we moved. He surprised us by saying that we were not alone. He saw some strange things in that house as well. When you think of Counter-Strike Global Offensive, the last thing you'd think of was a horror story. But yet, here I am. It was the summer of 2014 and I was bored and home alone, so naturally I hopped on CSGO. I went to Dust Online to play some casual. It wasn't a very busy lobby, there was about five people on each side. I joined Terrace, where I quickly discovered the only other person with a mic was a guy whose name was something like Smarties McFlurry. He sounded a lot older than me, I was 14 at the time. His name was Dave and we got along well and we played good together since we had the same number of skill. We eventually played more CSGO together and then friended each other on Steam. After that he asked for some of my social media and I gave him my Discord and Snapchat. Then on CSGO, Dave suddenly said he had to leave and we could play more tomorrow. So I got off and watched some TV and eventually went to sleep on the couch. I was home alone for the night. At like 1am, I awoke and got a glass of water. Then I heard a Snapchat notification from my phone. Curious as to who was sending snaps at this time of night, I picked it up and saw it was from Dave. I opened it and it was a picture of my front lawn and house. The phone and the glass of water fell from my hands to the floor and my heart began to race. I was suddenly frozen, as if rooted to the spot. The darkness around me seemed to become thicker and I swear I was seeing shadows all around me. Then I heard a knock at the glass. I turned to the back window and there he was, the Dave guy who looked a lot older and creepier than me. Without thinking, I ran to the back door, locked it. I also locked the front door. I could hear him calling to me through the window. Then I proceeded to run to the only windowless room, the bathroom. I stayed in there for about an hour, shaking and fearing the worst. I dreaded hearing the sound of Dave calling me again, a knock at the door, or even footsteps outside. I don't know how long it was before I fell asleep. The next morning, my parents arrived home and I hesitated to tell them about my experience. I knew they would drop shit on me, but it wasn't just that. I was questioning whether or not I was dreaming when the Dave guy appeared at my house. I knew I had not been dreaming playing CSGO with him though. However, when I checked my phone, it was like he didn't exist. He was not on my friends list in CSGO, his Steam account was gone, his Discord was gone, and even his Snapchat was gone, all deleted. To this day, I still question my sanity about whether or not this Dave guy who I played CSGO with really existed. I know for sure we had chatted on the game, on Discord and on Snapchat, but had he really come to my house? And why were all of his online accounts deleted? I really don't know. I was a big Tinder guy a few years ago. Everywhere I went, I would update my location and then update, you know, my body count. Then I quit doing Tinder and stuck with Instagram. I know they're completely different and IG has a bunch of fake accounts. So I saw this girl commenting on all of my friends' pictures. Then she commented on mine. I also saw my friends replying, so I figured she was a real person because I looked on her page and she had way more followers than people she was following. So I DM'd her. I definitely thought she wasn't going to reply, but she did within an hour. We talked for maybe two or three weeks and we made it official. She was pretty, had a degree, and a good job, as she said. 
I felt she was out of my league and too perfect. Every day she posted new photos and I told my friends about her and they seemed pretty jealous, except for my friend Ryan. He said I was stupid because I never spoke with her and I only messaged her. She invited me over because she said she can cook. Ryan told me to don't go. The rest of my friends said, don't have any kids and they would laugh. So I went over there, but not without Ryan calling me a clown first. The GPS says she lived about an hour away. When I first started to talk to her, she told me that she lived in a nice neighborhood. But when I got there, there were people everywhere and the neighborhood was not that nice. When I stopped at the stop sign at the corner, people walked up to my windows and asked me, what do I need? But I pulled off really fast and got to the house. It was a duplex, so I messaged her and she said to come up the stairs. It was about nine at night and people were everywhere just standing around. I knocked on the door and I was definitely excited. The door opened and to my surprise, it was a bald headed white guy with a patchy beard, tattoos everywhere, including his head with a tank top on. I asked was Lisa home and he said, yeah, come in. When I walked in, I was immediately hit with a musty smell mixed with cheese. He told me to sit down, and he sat down across from me on the couch. He said she'll be out soon. He asked me did I want something to drink, and I said, yeah, sure. When I got up, I texted her, can she come out, please? She immediately said yes. The man came back in with two cups of juice, one for him and one for myself. Then I noticed that he put a phone down on the table next to him. So I acted like I sneezed and got some on my arm. Then I asked for a tissue. He went to get some tissue and he left his phone like I thought he would. I texted her back and to my horror, the phone rang. I looked on the caller ID and it was my name. I heard him coming back. He came back and we sat there for about a minute. And then the phone rang again because he never checked the message that I sent. He looked at the phone. I looked at the phone. Then we looked at each other. I postured up and he calmly said, I guess you caught me. Then out of nowhere, he lunged toward me, attempting to grab me. I punched him and he fell on his face. I ran out of there so fast and I never looked back. Yeah. I called the cops, and when they got there, the man was still knocked out. After that, I never went on dates with people that I met online again. My name is Easton Miles, and I live in Pasadena, California. My wife Camille and I spent many hours on a secluded beach about 45 miles from our home. We traveled there whenever we could. We had found our own little quaint wooden beach overlooking some beautiful rock pools with an open stretch of beach that extended for miles both ways. We talked for hours and found it invigorating spending time away from the bustle of city life. One Saturday, on the 2nd of July 2016, about 1 p.m., Camille went for a walk to spend some peaceful, alone time on the beach. She was normally gone for about an hour, but on this day, she never returned. I was frantic with worry, not knowing what happened to her. I called the police. A woman by the name of Leah said she had passed a woman that fitted Camille's description, heading in the opposite direction, about a mile away at about 1.30 p.m. Leah said they had smiled at each other as they walked by. The police combed the beach and surrounding areas in teams for two weeks. But Camille was never found. I never left home for two months after that. I couldn't come to terms with it. When the love of your life is missing, there is no closure. Even though deep down, I had an undeniable feeling that she was dead. One warm Friday, I decided to revisit our special place. Maybe I'll see her, I thought as I approached our wooden bench. As I was about to sit down, I felt like someone was watching me. I wasn't wrong. I turned around and Leah was standing about 10 yards away, leaning against a rock. Leah? I said, feeling startled. Hi, Easton. She replied. 
It's so sad about your wife. How long has it been? Two months now? She added, a look of empathy on her pretty face. Yeah, I said, wondering what she was doing here. About right. You must be lonely and heartbroken. She said as she approached me. Do you mind if I join you? I mean, I don't want to intrude. She added in a gentle voice. The truth was that I wanted time alone, but maybe I needed her gentle presence. Leo was in her late 20s, very beautiful with soft, serene eyes and long, flowing brown hair. Sure, I answered. I'd like to just sit quietly, though, if you don't mind. I understand completely, Easton. She said as she sat next to me. We'd sat there without exchanging a word for about 10 minutes when I felt her place her hand on mine and turn to look at me. Leah, uh, I don't think this is appropriate. I said as I stood up, shocked and slightly angered. Oh, Easton, I'm so, so sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. She said, looking sad. I thought you may appreciate the comforting touch. Please accept my apologies. She pleaded. I felt bad. After all, I was going through a rough time, and she was just being kind. No, no, Leah. I'm sorry, I said. I... I guess I'm still very sensitive. What you did was very thoughtful. Really? She asked, looking for assurance. Yes, really, Leah. I answered with a gentle smile. Thank you for your support. We left shortly after that, but when I arrived at my car... I noticed her metallic blue Toyota Yaris parked about 20 yards behind mine. Coincidence? Probably. We both left, but as I was nearing the off-ramp to my home, I spotted her car three cars behind me. I felt uneasy, but maybe she lived near me. I visited Camille in my favorite spot on two occasions shortly after that, and it was becoming freaky, as on both occasions, Leah arrived a short while after I did. On the first of these two visits, Leah had a picnic basket in her hand. She sat next to me quietly and unwrapped a sandwich, handing it to me. It was shredded beef, onion, and baby gherkin with hot English mustard. It was my favorite and something Camille had always made for me. How? How did, how did you know? I asked. You look like a beef and mustard man. <laughs> she said, smiling. I hadn't eaten properly in months and finished off another two sandwiches. On this occasion, she held my hand and put her head on my shoulder. I was uncomfortable, but I didn't want to offend her kind gesture. A week later, I visited the old wooden bench again. This time, when I arrived, I didn't see Leah's car, but she was lying on the bench, the wind lifting her braided white skirt, revealing way more than I should have been seeing. She appeared to be asleep. I gently called her name, moving away from the view. She stretched out and sat up. Oh, Easton! <laughs> she said, acting surprised. I must have fallen asleep. Hi, Leah, I said. She was looking at me with seductive eyes. Do you ever? She trailed off. Do I ever what? I asked. You know, do you ever miss it? She asked, her eyes drawing me in. You mean sex, Leah? I asked matter-of-factly. The truth was, I was becoming aroused, but I couldn't allow this. Oh, Easton, do me here, do me now, she said, breathing heavily. Feeling vulnerable, the temptation to do the wrong thing was strong, but I stormed off. This is going too far, Leah, I shouted as I left. Stay away from me. All I could hear was, I'm so sorry, Easton, oh, I'm so sorry. I thought you may find it comforting. Please forgive me. Comforting? This was getting too close for comfort. Reaching my car hurriedly, I drove off without looking back, thinking it was the last time I would ever see Leah again. I was wrong. Arriving home from work the following day, Leah's Toyota Yaris was parked outside. What the hell is she doing here? I thought. How does she know where I live? To top it all, she was nowhere to be seen. The porch light went on and the front door opened. Leah was standing in the doorway. I quickly approached her. I thought I'd surprise you, Easton. <laughs> she said with a giggle that was unbefitting. How the hell did you get into my house, Leah? I demanded angrily. Please don't anger me, Easton. She said, trying to look cute. Where did you get the keys to my house from? I shouted aggressively. You know what your problem is, Easton? 
She started with her back to me. I saw the gun in her hand as she turned to face me. You don't appreciate me! Her tone had changed. Sit down! She said firmly, pushing me onto the couch. The gun was pointed directly at me, and I was afraid. You don't remember me, do you? She asked. Leah Williams? Quiet, little Leah Williams? The school librarian? The nerd? Suddenly, I recalled who she was. I watched you every day. We were made for each other. But then you choose Camellia? Now we can be together, Easton. Finally, I get the love of my life. Leah, what happened to Camilla? I asked, the picture emerging. Promise you'll love me forever, Easton. And I'll put the gun away. She said, tears now welling up in her eyes. Camilla, I started, and then I saw Camilla's keys hooked onto Leah's belt. She said in a sick, distorted way. I buried her next to a palm tree in a grove. I made it quick for her. You don't have to worry about her anymore, Easton. It's time for us now. Oh, God. No. I heard myself cry out from my gut. As she lowered the gun, I saw my opportunity, but a fraction away from her, a shot deafened me. She had shot herself up through the mouth, and there was blood everywhere. I don't remember calling the police, but they arrived. Camilla's body was found two days later in a bad state of decay. My mental health suffered intensely, and I couldn't talk for three months. I have been going for trauma counseling for more than a year now. I don't think my life will ever return to normal again. My name's Emmett Tanner, and I'm now 43 years old. I joined the U.S. Marines at a young age and excelled in self-defense as a sniper. Due to my skills, I was chosen to be part of an elite, top-secret group for the security of various members of the state under then-President George H.W. Bush from January 1990 to November 1992. I received the rank of second lieutenant. My job mainly involved surveillance from buildings with a rifle, using high-tech sights and a pair of telescopic binoculars. During my service, I'd had to take two people out who both had attempted to assassinate two high-ranking officials. I enjoyed that job. It gave me a great thrill knowing that I had the lives of many in my hands and my observation and sighting skills became second nature to me. I served for another nine years after that until 2001. What I didn't realize at the time was that my skills would become an obsession. Today is the 30th of April 2007 and I'm in jail for life. So to me, it's just another day. During my stint in the Marines, I was stationed in Houston. Our sleeping quarters consisted of two 10-story buildings directly opposite one another, one for males and the other building quarters for female officers. I was on the 10th floor, in a room of my own on a corner of the building facing the women's dwelling. My night vision binoculars were so powerful that I could see a dime on the pavement 10 floors below. But I wasn't interested in looking at dimes. There were four women officers whom I found extremely enticing, and in a monochrome green night after night, I watched them undress and watch TV in skimpy nighties. One stood out from the rest. Captain Harlow Delaney was the sexiest of them all. On hot summer nights, she would sit in only her underwear and brush her beautiful long auburn hair, and she always came out of her shower into her living room completely naked, with a towel wrapped around her head. She never bothered to draw her curtains as nobody could see anything from our building, 150 yards away. Except someone spying on her with a pair of binoculars. Someone like me. I didn't realize just how sick I was then, and never considered myself a stalker. But this went on for two years. After so much time spent taking in her beauty, I wanted to have sex with Captain Delaney. One day, while everyone was going about their duties at our base camp about two miles away, I climbed the stairs in the woman's dorm, red roses in hand, and within seconds had Miss Delaney's apartment door open. I inhaled her scent as I sprinkled rose petals all over her bed and trailed them to her door. I found some lipstick and wrote on her bathroom window, You're just so hot, Captain Harlow Delaney. Then I took out a notepad and wrote her a letter. I watch you every night, and you really turn me on. I know you want me. 
You just don't know how much you want me yet. I placed it on her coffee table. She had left her cell phone in her room, and so I took down her number. That evening, I waited with a bated breath for her to come home. She arrived at around 6 p.m., and I could see the shock on her face when she came into vision. No night sights needed. As I looked through the binoculars, she appeared to be staring straight at me. Shit! I cursed as I crouched down. Had she seen me? I thought as my heart raced. She couldn't have, I convinced myself. I had voice pitch lowering software on my cell. I activated it and then called her. Captain Delaney, she answered, sounding shaken. I hope you like your surprise, Lieutenant, I said, my two-tone octaves lower. Who the hell are you? she shouted back. A secret admirer, baby. Don't be angry. By the way, your scent fills your place, and it drives me wild, I responded. Whoever you are, you're toast, you freak. I'm calling security, she said angrily and firmly. Ah, gee, why'd you want to do that, I asked. Aren't you just touched that you have someone who can't resist you? She quickly cut me off. I took another peek through the binoculars, and within two minutes, two male marines and a fellow female officer had entered her apartment. Suddenly, someone knocked on my door. Who the hell can that be? I questioned. I hastily packed away my binoculars, expecting the worst. Hey, Emmett, buddy, came the voice with a friendly smile as I opened the door. It was Arlo from down the hall. Hey, Arlo, what's up, bud? I asked casually. I could see he wanted to come in, but I stood holding the door. Just wanted to return your book, Emmett, he said, passing me my book called Criminals and Justice. Some badass people in there, he said, particularly the stalkers, he added. Thank goodness they're all caught. They always get caught. Bastards, he said as he turned to leave. Yeah, bastards, I added. See you around, bud. Sometimes you feel like you've been hit with a sledgehammer, and this was one of those times. The next morning before roll call at 8 a.m., I waited to one side until I spotted Captain Delaney. She was walking alone, so I approached her and saluted her. Morning, Captain, I said smartly. Morning, Lieutenant, she said with a smile, but she looked troubled. What can I do for you, Emmett? she asked. I just wanted to say hi, Captain. You're looking very smart today, I quipped. Thank you, Emmett, she said, looking towards the ground. Is something wrong, ma'am? I asked. Some madman went into my room yesterday and spread rose petals all over the place. The intruder also wrote some sick, perverted letter and smeared some filth on my bathroom mirror with lipstick. That's dreadful, ma'am. Some real sickos on the prowl, I said, acting concerned. If there's anything I can do, I started. Thank you, Emmett, she answered, but I have some people on the case. Captain Delaney had referred to me as a madman and a pervert. I didn't take kindly to that at all. I smiled, saluted her, and lined up for roll call. As the day drew to a close, I waited behind a wall near the entrance to the ladies' apartment building and came out into the open as Captain Delaney arrived. It was already 7.15 p.m., and she was startled at seeing me. Emmett, what are you doing here? she asked. Just making sure you get home safely, Captain, and that you don't have a repeat of yesterday, I responded in a concerned tone. That's very kind of you, Emmett, but I've already told you I have people on the case, she said rather firmly. I was offended. A madman? A pervert? And now rejection of my offer to help? I went upstairs to my room and locked the door. I was about to teach Captain Harlow Delaney a lesson. I removed my sniper rifle from its case and assembled it together with its night sight and silencer. I very quickly had her in my crosshairs, but then she moved out of sight. Then I saw Major Ann Taylor appear. They were close friends. They began chatting as I was becoming impatient. I had an opportunity as my crosshair centered on Captain Delaney's forehead. Squeeze. I pulled the trigger. Simultaneously, Captain Delaney moved, and the bullet struck Major Taylor in her chest, killing her instantly. I think everyone in the area heard Captain Delaney scream. Damn, I said under my breath, shit! Forensic experts quickly traced the trajectory of the bullet to my room. By the next morning, after checking that my rifle had been fired only 10 hours earlier, I was arrested and sentenced to life imprisonment. <sighs> I miss those exciting days. Perhaps I'll be out soon for good behavior. My name is Hector Abbott, and I live on the second floor of an old apartment block in Green Street, Soho in downtown New York. I retired two years ago, and I'm now 62. I was a paratrooper in the military and keep myself fit by working out every day. I'm what one might classify as an ardent observer. I sit on my balcony, and it's like watching TV. 
In fact, I don't own a TV. The daily activities on Green Street keep me entertained. The other day, while purchasing some fresh bread rolls from Allison's Bakery, a block away on the opposite side of Green Street, I met the lovely young lady who owns and runs the small bakery carrying her name. The scent of freshly baked items wafted through the shop. I had seen her place but had never gone inside. I don't miss much and noticed a guy of around 30 doing window shopping outside the bakery, except there wasn't much in the window area but a small price list. He had blonde hair combed to one side and a pair of faded blue jeans and a black leather jacket on. Beautiful little business you have here, I remarked, keeping an eye on the tall slender guy at the window. Why thank you sir, are you from around here? Allison asked. Yeah, the name's Hector Abbott and I live in an apartment a block away, I responded, noticing the guy outside was staring at Allison. He quickly looked away when I turned to face him. Well, because you're a new customer, you can have the bread rolls on the house, Mr. Abbott, Allison offered kindly with a friendly and warm smile. That's very kind of you, Allison. I'll be sure to buy all my baked goodies from you from now on, I responded cheerfully. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, sir, she added all bright-eyed. I gave her a warm smile, but as I turned to leave, I noticed that guy who had been outside was now on the side of the street that I lived on, but still opposite the bakery. I crossed the road at an angle to walk back to my apartment, but kept a close vigil on him out of the corner of my eye. As I arrived at my apartment block, I saw him head back towards Allison's bakery. I had a gut feeling that something was amiss with this guy, so I began walking back towards him. As he saw me, he turned, pulled the hood of his black jacket over his head, and walked away swiftly. I stood there for 10 minutes to make sure that he never came back. Allison was kind and a friendly young lady, and I cared about her safety. The next morning, I rose at my normal time of 4.30 a.m., made a cup of coffee, and, lighting a smoke, went to sit on my balcony. At about 5.30 a.m., I saw the same guy dressed the same about two blocks away on the bakery side of the road. Leaning against a wall with one leg propped up against it, he lit one cigarette after another, the whole while gazing around suspiciously. I knew he was waiting for Allison. I don't know how, but I just knew it. At around 6.30 a.m. I saw Allison in the distance, climbing off a bus and heading to her shop. The guy stood up straight and took out a book, pretending to read it. As Allison neared him, he lowered the book and remarked, Beautiful morning for a beautiful lady. Being polite, Allison responded with dignity, Thanks for the compliment, and what's your name? You can call me Frank, Allison, he said. Mind if I walk you to the bakery? Well, um, she felt awkward as he was a stranger. Can't be careful enough in this part of town. There's some real wackos around. Well, okay then, she replied so as not to offend him. As they walked, she felt uneasy as Frank kept eyeing her all over. When they reached the bakery, she said politely, Thank you, Frank. You have a good day now. Oh, I will, Allison. It started off well just walking next to you, he replied with a smirk before walking away. I put on some decent clothes and headed for Allison's bakery. As I did so, I thought I saw the guy suddenly sneak into the alley about 30 yards away. Is that guy harassing you, Allison? I asked, entering the shop. He wanted to walk me to the bakery. He said there's a lot of wackos around. I thought it was harmless enough, but he kept on staring at me. I'll keep an eye on him for you. I don't trust him, I replied. He made me feel very uneasy, Mr. Abbott. Said his name was Frank. Don't fret, Allison. I got you covered. I said as I turned to leave. Thank you, Mr. Abbott. I would appreciate it, she smiled. Sitting on my balcony close to Allison's 5 p.m. closing time, I noticed Frank crossing the road with his jacket hood on, but he headed towards the same alley I had seen him move into earlier. After locking up, as Allison moved to pass the alley, Frank stepped out, startling her. You gave me a fright, Frank, she said as her palms became sweaty. Ah, Allison, sorry about that. But remember, I'm not one of the wackos around here, he said with wide eyes and a snicker. I'll walk you to your bus ride, he added. This was becoming too much. I really don't need escorting Frank, and I'd appreciate it if you left me the hell alone, she retorted angrily. She doesn't recognize me or remember me, he thought as he walked away. I quickly moved downstairs. After Allison had walked about a hundred yards, Frank began following her. I kept my distance and followed without being seen. As Allison's bus departed, she noticed Frank standing with his arms folded. He quickly pointed at her with a sick smile on his face, and then gestured with the peace sign. I approached him openly, but when he saw me, he rapidly made his way through the heavy traffic, and I lost him. 
At least Allison was on her way home safely. Frank continued his antics for another four days. I just couldn't pin him down, and Allison was a nervous wreck. We reported his activity to the police. I never oversleep, but the next morning I woke up with a startle. It was 7.30 a.m. I quickly moved to my balcony viewpoint. Allison's bakery was still closed, and neither her nor Frank were anywhere to be seen. I knew something was wrong. I got dressed quickly, skipped coffee, and went straight to the bakery. I tried the door. It wasn't locked, which was a big sign that something was seriously wrong. I entered quietly and looked around. No sign of anyone. Allison had a small kitchen at the back of her shop where she made tea and took her lunch breaks. I opened the door slowly and will never forget that sight. Allison was tied up and gagged. Her feet and hands were also tied together, and her eyes were wide with fear. She never made a sound, but moved her head and eyes as though trying to let me know that Frank was here too. Suddenly, I felt his presence. I turned around as he closed the door while facing us. He had a large butcher's knife in his right hand. Old man, he said aggressively. Didn't your mom ever teach you to mind your own business? He grunted as he began moving the knife between hands. I took the deceptive, helpless Tai Chi stance, ready to use my combat skills. <laughs> You're pathetic, old man, he laughed. You look like an idiot. Allison was writhing and moaning with the gag in her mouth. Frank managed to move about three inches closer, and then he didn't have time to know what hit him. In a split second, the knife went flying. I busted his arm and tripped him over backwards with one foot behind his. It only took 15 seconds and I'd beaten him senseless. He was bleeding from mouth, eyes, and nose. Writhing and crying out in agony, I said to him, That'll teach you not to mess with a 62-year-old paratrooper, you piece of shit. Then I kicked him in the head, and he was out for the count. I removed Allison's gag and untied her. She gasped for air, but eventually her breathing steadied. Other than a few bruises from the tight ropes, she was unharmed. Thank you, Mr. Abbott, she said repeatedly. Where'd you learn to fight like that, she asked. I just smiled. <laughs> Age is just a number, my friend. Let's call the cops. The police arrived promptly, and after questioning us, they had to carry the unconscious Frank to their van. Looking at me with my short gray hair, the two policemen couldn't believe that I was the one who had reduced a man much younger than myself to an unconscious mess on the floor. I checked in on Allison regularly after that, and we became close friends. <laughs> a 62-year-old and a 25-year-old. Never again would Frank be stalking her. He was charged with severe harassment and attempted murder. Despite the event being extremely traumatic for Allison, news of the incident spread quickly and gained her twice as many customers. I still sit and observe from my viewpoint. When Frank Hansen was questioned by the police, they found out that he and Allison had been at school together. He confessed at being grossly overweight as a scholar, and despite Allison having quite a few boyfriends, she always rejected his advances. He held the grudge against her for 10 years, vowing that one day he would win her over. He worked out regularly and finally got the physique he thought would impress her. When she showed no interest in him yet again and didn't even recognize him, it was a snapping point for him. Unfortunately for him, his plan of raping and murdering Allison was foiled by a 62-year-old paratrooper. It's perfect. Those were the words that came out of my mouth after I had been shown the tour of my new apartment. I was 22 at the time and I was going to college in the city. Like most big cities, finding a good apartment seemed impossible as I had been searching for months and it wasn't until the last week of the fourth month that I found something I really liked. To be honest, I was shocked no one had snatched it up already. It had a spacious living room, a usable kitchen, enough bathrooms, and a perfect bedroom. I loved everything about it. Well, almost everything. The air in the apartment was a bit thick, and this was because of the numerous perfumed air fresheners that were situated all over the apartment. I didn't know why the place needed that many air fresheners, but it was the only mandatory thing that my landlord, Mr. Terrence, asked for. My opinions on my landlord, Mr. Terrence, were pretty normal. He was an awkward but quiet guy which was a bit weird to me as he had a really huge bill. So his character didn't match his appearance. As he stood in the apartment with me, Mr. Terrence looked at me and said, So that's it, Nathan. Uh, remember to leave the air fresheners on every day, uh, in addition to spray a new can in the living room every morning before you leave. He then handed me a box filled with new air fresheners. 
The obsession with the perfumed air fresheners was a bit weird to me, but I didn't say a word, seeing as he offered this apartment to me for a very low price. To be honest, the low price was another thing that was odd to me, as the apartment was a bit on the fancier side and it clearly cost more than that. So I was really shocked when he immediately agreed to let me live there for the low rent fee that I could offer. And I could recall that during our first meeting, it really seemed like he just wanted someone to live there. But I wasn't complaining because I saw it as a huge win for me and after settling in, I slept happily that night in my new apartment. So it had been a couple of weeks since I moved into the new apartment and while I still loved the place, I noticed a couple of strange things that were going on. For starters, I noticed that the other tenant who lived in the building actively avoided my apartment like a plague. I remember spending days wondering why they did that. At first, I thought they were just jealous of my place. But as time went by, I realized that it wasn't jealousy. These people were truly terrified of my apartment, and the look of fear on their faces every time they crossed the hall said it all. Due to this strange behavior, the only people who visited my apartment were my friends from college. On one particular day when I was coming back home, I overheard some of the tenants talking about my place, and through the course of the conversation, I heard them call it the cursed apartment. Now, I wasn't one to believe petty gossip, but I would be lying if I said the strange rumors didn't worry me. That night, I went to bed trying to get some sleep, but I kept thinking about what I heard earlier. So in order to get more comfortable, I turned in my bed to assume a better sleeping position. But as I was turning out of the corner of my eye, I could see the silhouette of a huge man looming over me. The terrifying sight made my heart skip as I tried my best to muffle a scream. From the slight glimpse, I could tell the man was a lot bigger than me so a direct confrontation would surely end badly for me. But I also knew that lying still and pretending to sleep wasn't a smart idea as the intruder was bound to attack sooner or later. So I planned out the last best option in my head and I put it into action. With no hesitation, I threw my blanket towards the intruder. Stunned that I was awake, he made an attempt to grab me, but the blanket I threw at him bought me some time and within seconds, I ran at full speed towards my bathroom. Once I was safely inside, I locked the door and called the cops, screaming. While the cops were on their way, I listened at the door to see if the intruder was making his move. But all I heard was silence. I assumed it was a play made by the intruder to make me lower my guard, so I stayed in the bathroom till the cops arrived. When the cops arrived, they searched the apartment before letting me out of the bathroom. I was then asked a couple of questions and I told them everything they needed to know. But after looking around and carrying out a small investigation, the cops began to doubt my claim as the head officer asked me, Are you sure you saw someone in here? Because from the look of things, uh, it really seems like no one apart from you was here. Confused, I said, But I'm sure I saw someone watching me while I was sleeping. He also attempted to attack me. The officer then looked at me and said, Well, we checked the door and there was no signs of breaking and entering. Baffled at his statement, I didn't know what else to say. As if there weren't any signs of breaking in, I didn't have any proof apart from my word. The officer saw I was having a hard time making sense of things, so he said, Look kid, I know you are confused right now, but I heard it's finals week, so maybe the pressures of the exam is getting to you and making you see things. Trust me, college finals can do that to a man. The other officers laughed at his joke, but I didn't. I was still in shock and I wasn't in the mood to laugh. The cops left after a while, and they told me to be sure that there was someone before I called the next time. The week that followed after that incident was horrible, as I couldn't sleep well and I was jumping at the sound of every little thing. Soon the rumors of the apartment being cursed started to seem true to me, and I eventually couldn't take it anymore. So the next day, I went across the hall and begged my neighbor, Old Lady Grace, to tell me why my apartment was the subject of many rumors and if those rumors were true. When we had settled in her apartment, she told me a morbid tale about how, for the past 12 years, all eight tenants who have lived in my apartment had mysteriously disappeared. She said that back-to-back -back disappearances had caused quite a stir in the neighborhood, and people started getting anxious. But even with all the tension, it was only the people who lived in my apartment who went missing. She then said the cops had opened up numerous missing persons cases due to the rising number of grieving families, but the bodies of all eight tenants were never found. She then added that Mr. Terrence, my landlord, was always questioned after every one of his tenants had gone missing, but he always proved he had nothing to do with it, and he always walked free. 
As she spoke about Mr. Terrence, I noticed she had a bit of anger in her voice, so I asked, Hey, I know this is a bit forward, Miss Grace, but do you have anything against my landlord, Terrence? The old woman then looked at me and said, No, I have no problems with him, but there's something about that man. You're young, so you won't understand, but I can see things, and something isn't right with him. Her words struck me as I left her apartment. I told myself that I really didn't find anything wrong with my landlord, Terrence. Apart from the incessant use of air fresheners, he seemed like a, a nice man, but even then, I wasn't going to take any chances. That night, I stayed up doing research on the cases, and I found out everything that old Lady Grace said was true, so I made up my mind to move. I started making preparations to move the next day. I managed to get a place to stay as one of my friends allowed me to stay with him until I found another place. To avoid any problems, I decided not to tell Mr. Terrence that I was moving till the next morning when I was ready to leave. I can't really remember, but I'm guessing it was due to the abrupt moving process as I forgot to put on or spray the air fresheners that morning. I spent the whole day at my friend's house setting up my things and after a long day's work, I went back home knowing it'd be the last night I'd spend in the strange apartment. But when I got home, a truly morbid and rancid smell filled my nostrils. It was so bad that I found it hard to breathe. I rushed to open a window or get a can of air fresheners with the words, So I heard you're moving, made me freeze. I slowly turned around to see who said the sentence, and standing there in the dark was my landlord, Mr. Terrence. Fear filled me as I started to stutter the words, oh, 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 What are you doing here, Mr. Terrence? Totally ignoring my question, he said, Why didn't you tell me you, you were moving? Were you just going to leave? I then slowly answered him with, I was going to tell you in the morning, Mr. Terrence. My landlord then looked at me and said, Why are you leaving? Because of some false rumors that you heard? You'd be a fool to give up this apartment after I basically let you live here for a non-existent price. It was dark and I couldn't see Mr. Terrence's face, but I could hear the rising anger in his voice, so I said, You're scaring me now, Mr. Terrence, and I think you need to leave. He ignored my statement again before proceeding to say something that I wasn't expecting. As Terrence looked at me, dead in the eyes, he said in a calm voice, Do you collect anything, Nathan? Stunned at the totally irrelevant question, I didn't know what to say. But before I could answer the question, he said, Well, I do. You see, Nathan, I collect these things called human beings. To be honest, I currently have eight in my collection and I'm looking to increase that number to nine by the end of this night. It took me a while for my mind to register the horrifying statement that my landlord had just made. But before I could react, he lunged at me with his fist in the air. Within seconds, he was in front of me, but I managed to dodge the dangerous punch. His hand went through the drywall and the wall pieces went flying through the air. Frustrated, he pulled his hand out of the wall and for a split second, everything clicked as I had a horrible realization about Mr. Terrence's collectibles. It was dark, but there was no mistaking it. Staring right at me was a rotting corpse situated in the wall of my apartment. My mind started unraveling at the ghastly sight, but I didn't stop because I knew if I didn't do something quickly, I would soon join his collection inside the walls. Mr. Terrence was free now, and as he saw my pale face, he said, I see you've seen where I keep my wonderful collectibles. Don't worry. You'll soon make a fine addition. I rushed for the door, but I wasn't quick enough as he managed to tackle me into a table. The contents of the table spilled over as we fell to the floor struggling. I fought back with all my strength, but it was hopeless as he was two times bigger than me. And it didn't take long before he had his arms wrapped around my neck. I don't know if you've ever been strangled before, but there aren't enough words to describe how painful it is. I couldn't breathe as I felt him put his whole weight down on my neck. I gasped for air as the world around me began to dim. I thrashed and struggled to look for something, anything that I could use to defend myself, and I was about to give up before I felt it. One of my hands thrashing had managed to get a hold of an air freshener can. It must have been one of the cans that fell when we collided into the table. I knew the can wasn't strong enough to knock him out, so I decided to temporarily blind him. With no hesitation, I picked up the can and sprayed it in his eyes. He screamed and reached for his eyes as he finally let go of my neck. I then struck his head with the can before rushing to the door 
and as I opened it, I ran into the arms of numerous cops that had just arrived. I would later find out old lady Grace had heard the noises from my apartment, so she called the cops. I don't know if it was from the fighting or the fear, but I passed out there, happy that I had survived the cursed apartment. After that incident, numerous things surrounding the apartment were revealed. Mr. Terrence was arrested, and after his apartment was searched and tore down, over eight badly preserved corpses were found in the walls, and each and every one of them was identified as the bodies of his former tenants. After interrogations, Mr. Terrence also confessed to watching his tenants, potential victims, when they slept. He also went into details about how he got the preserved bodies into the walls, as he said he managed to do it all under the ruse of remodeling the apartment. He then finally confessed to keeping a spare key to the apartment, a key that was unknown to his residents. The families of the victims called for him to be put to death, but he was instead sentenced to life imprisonment. After the whole case had been settled, I moved back to the suburbs with my family. I didn't finish college as I was told I needed time to heal from the traumatizing event. Even after all this time, the therapy still doesn't work as there's nothing anyone can tell me to make me get over the fact that I slept in a room filled with eight corpses for over four months. But on the bright side, I left the morbid experience with a lesson as I realized that it's not only people that have stories, Places, too, always have a tale to tell, and those tales should be important to anyone who is deciding to live or stay in those places, because the knowledge of those tales may one day save or end your life. Sometimes in life, you do a silly prank that turns out to be doomsday for someone else. Well, that's exactly what happened to me when I was a kid. I grew up in a huge house by the beach with my little sister Amy. She was a year younger than me. Being the youngest and the pretty little princess of our family, everyone loved her like crazy. My mom always gave me a lecture on how I need to be the big brother and take care of her all the time. All that overflown love spoiled my sister to such an extent that she became stubborn and nagging whenever things didn't go her way. In front of my parents and family, she would behave like she is the angel on the earth but in reality, she was different in the wrong way. She never apologized after making a mistake, and no matter how many times she got punished, she always found her way around it. I guess it was partially my mother's fault for being too easy on her. I still remember the day the principal called dad saying there has been an accident in school. I was with my grandparents, but when I came home, I heard a girl named Sally was found dead in the girl's bathroom. No one knows what exactly happened to her, but it seemed like she slipped somehow and smashed her face on the glass mirror, leading to the broken glass cutting her eyeballs in half. She bled to death. Yeah, it was a pretty violent sight. When the cops inquired everyone about this incident, the school janitor said he saw Amy coming out of the washroom right before Sally's body was discovered. But she was just a little girl. Who would suspect her, right? But I knew. I knew what she was. With more days passing, I started to become scared of her. Yeah, scared of my little sister. Funny, huh? But when you wake up in the middle of the night finding your weird sister standing near your bed, looking at her with her shiny green eyes and expressionless face, you can't laugh it off. Why did she do that? I don't know, and I never dared to ask. Whoever didn't agree with her or said no faced a consequence labeled under the tag of an accident. She loved stomping on any insect, even if it's miles away from her. She grabbed butterflies with her soft red fingers and tore their wings apart with joy. Whenever birds hurt their wings and landed in our backyard, instead of aiding them like every normal kid, Amy fed the already suffering bird to our neighbor's ferocious dog. She chuckled in excitement as the dog shredded the flapping bird into bits and pieces. My parents never paid attention to her cruel nature, even if I told them repeatedly. But one day, things took a dangerous turn. We used to go to the beach almost every weekend. I loved walking by the shore, submerging my feet into the salty waves. At some distance from the shore, there were rusty old caves. The area was secluded as very few people went there. Whenever I needed a place to escape, I used to go there. I pretended like the caves were my kingdom, 
and I was the king of an invisible ray. I kept lots of my toys there and everything I could collect from the beach. I never told Amy about this place, but nothing can be hidden from her vulture eyes. One weekend, we went to the beach and my parents put up a small picnic near the shore. Amy got busy building her sandcastles and then demolishing them with one kick. I think she felt more joy in destroying them than building them. I secretly snuck out from there and went to my territory. I put up a wooden plank on the entrance of a small cave like a door to my castle. I slowly shifted the plank and got inside. I was just about to close it when I heard a chuckle behind me. Out of fear and shock, I turned around and found Amy sitting inside the cave already. You think you can hide from me? She said in her cold, squeaky voice. I wasn't hiding from you. I just came here to be with myself. I replied and sat down on the ground. You hate me, right? Secretly, you wish I was never born, right? What? I don't wish that. Oh, but I do. I wish I was the only child and mommy and daddy never had you. I would have gotten all their attention. You anyway get that. Don't worry, once I grow up, I'll move far away from you all. Ha ha ha, you're such a dork. Come on, let's go. Amy got up and started to walk out of the cave. Where, where are you going? I asked impatiently. I saw a big cave at the back. Don't you want to explore that? Her eyes sparkled as she said this. But we can lose our way. Besides, what if there's something inside those caves? Like, like what, a tiger? Don't be an idiot. Let's go. Also, I want to try this out. So far, I didn't notice her hands, but as I did, I saw she was holding dad's metal detector. I know dad keeps his things in his study and we're not supposed to touch them. I said in a tense voice, why did you bring that? You know we shouldn't be playing with dad's equipment. Oh, come on. He wouldn't know unless you tell him and you won't tell him. I knew she was not going to back off. We came out and started walking to the big cave behind the bushes. The summer wind created a rustling sound in the coconut trees. The big old cave stood like an epitome of mystery. Moss and fungus were growing all over its wall. Amy stopped right in front of the cave and stared at the dark, hollow entrance ahead. Why are we even here? I asked fearfully. We are going to look for treasure. Don't you remember the story mom told us last night? Caves like this are filled with treasures. Now let's go for our treasure hunt. Amy handed me a small flashlight and told me to show the way. I realized how mean and selfish she is. If anything bad came at us, she wanted me to face it. My own sister was using me as her shield just to have some fun in a stupid treasure hunt. But she was very greedy. If Amy found something attractive, my parents had to buy it for her. And if they didn't, she didn't hesitate to steal it at all. Mom's story triggered her to think she was going to find a hidden treasure inside this cave. That's why she brought dad's metal detector. But I was sure. I knew she would go home empty handed. I was walking with a flashlight while she strolled with her metal detector behind me. The continuous beeping of the detector echoed in the cave. Accidentally, I flashed a light on the ceiling and an army of ugly, stinky bats flew over us, scaring the hell out of me. Ah! You silly! Don't flash your light on them, idiot! Amy didn't respect me at all. Maybe it was her cruel nature that made her immune to all kinds of jump scares. She snatched the flashlight from my hand and took the lead. Without saying a single word, I followed her. Even though she was not the perfect sister, I couldn't ditch her inside a dark cave. After walking for a minute or so, the metal detector started to make a rapid sound, denoting it had found something. Amy crouched down and started to dig the wet, muddy ground with her beach shovel. Within five seconds, she screamed in joy. Look what I found! She lifted her hand, and in the flashlight, I saw a sparkling bracelet. Her face lit up even more greed. The bracelet was shining like the stars in the night sky. I didn't at all expect something like this to be found here. Amy picked up the detector and started walking ahead. I stopped her saying, well, you got your treasure. Let's go now. It's getting dark and mom will be worried. No way. We have just started. If you want to go, you can go. Fine. I am done here. I turned back while Amy went in with the detector and flashlight. The beeping sound faded away with her footsteps. 
I was about to come out when I heard my sister's spine-chilling scream. I ran inside, irrespective of the darkness. I could barely see ahead when I heard a collapse of boulders. At the end of the cave, I found Amy's flashlight. The glass got broken, but was still on. A beeping sound was going crazy in the dark, and there was another sound in that empty cave. The sound of a little girl choking. I flashed the light following the sound, and I couldn't blink anymore. Amy was lying on the ground, smashed under big rocks falling from the roof of the cave. Her partial face had no features. Flesh and blood were all over the place. But with the half remaining face, she was staring at me. She was looking at me with one eye and trying to tell me something, but the excessive blood choked her. She coughed blood. Her body trembled like those wounded birds when the neighbor's dog ate them alive. I will never be able to get that sight out of my mind. My parents rescued me with the help of the cops. After searching for us for almost an hour, they finally came to look at these caves and found me standing like a statue near my dead sister. It was all an accident. No one had any doubt of that. My mom never spoke a word after that. Cops said the cave's roof somehow collapsed and it was nothing but an unfortunate event. I won't say that I don't miss her, but we learned to move on. I accepted her fate and grieved for her terrible death for years. But yesterday, my mom passed away in her sleep and her attorney handed me a letter that she left for me. The letter read, My dear Jim, we all loved Amy in our own ways. I know you resent me for not raising her with more discipline and good habits. I agree, I was weak, but then I finally realized. The day Sally died, I knew what a monster I had created. I had to put an end to this. The cave's roof didn't collapse on its own. I was the one who buried the bracelet inside and told Amy the made-up story about treasure just to make her go there looking for it. I sacrificed my own child so that she can't hurt anyone else. It was better that she got the punishment from me rather than rotting in a cell for the rest of her life. I hope you forgive me for taking your sister away too soon. I am glad that at least one of my children grew up to be a human being. Love, Mom. I'm not really someone that tells stories. If I were at a party or with a group of friends, I'd be that girl who would just listen and keep to herself. But in life, something happens, and you have to tell somebody to at least get that weight off your chest. I was in my second year of studying business management at a highly respected college. I don't want to mention which school it was because, as I said, I'm a private person. Moving on, I was on a break, summer break, and like all introverted kids do, instead of going to parties and hanging out with friends, I decided that the mature thing to do was to get a job. My dad always said, you have to work hard if you want to make it in this world. As I was walking past a pizza shop that I frequently visited during my late night cramming sessions, when I needed food and energy drinks to have the stamina to stay awake, I saw that they were hiring. One thing led to another and there I was, behind the counter with a red apron on, surrounded by the smell of delicious pizza eight hours a day, five days a week. I know what you're thinking. It seems like a great summer job. Well, bear with me here. Each day was the same. Regulars would come in, order the usual, and after some chit chat while the pizza would be done or the slice would be heated up, they'd be on their way. Occasionally new customers would enter and believe it or not, that was the hardest part of the job. As a shy person, I managed to get used to regulars and became comfortable speaking to them, but new faces always made me shell up. All was well and good at the pizza place until one horrific evening. I'll never forget that day. It was July 17th. It was pouring outside and there were no clients except for one elderly man that was sitting at a table, enjoying his pizza in silence. Besides me and him, my manager Teddy was in the back doing what managers do best, watching TV of course. It was about closing time, almost 20 minutes away to be exact, so I walked away from behind the counter and headed toward the empty tables. With my trusty rad in hand, I was carefully taking care of the crumbs and pepperoni slices that fell from people's mouths. Yeah, glamorous, indeed. As I was doing my job, the bell that was attached right above the door rang. I couldn't believe it. Who'd come by this late, and especially in this weather? But then I remembered. 
I was their most loyal customer during finals. As I looked up, it was a man, quite tall, dressed all in black, having the collar of his soaked jacket as high as it could go, while at the same time wearing a black, cowboy-style hat that covered his eyes. All I could see as he walked in was his big nose. I'll be right with you, sir, I said while he took a seat at a table. I just finished cleaning. Normally clients would come and order at the counter, but seeing that he had already sat down and taking into consideration the fact that I was not busy at all, I decided to do a good deed and take his order at the table. I came back in a flash and seeing that he was soaking wet with water dripping all over the table and the floor, I told him politely with a big smile on my face, sir, you know you can hang your hat and coat on the coat rack behind you. Without even acknowledging my suggestion, he put his hand on the table. I could see a poorly done snake tattoo, which looked like it would have been done in prison. A slight chill went down my spine. After a moment of silence when neither of us said anything, I moved on and asked him what he wanted to eat. Surprise me, he responded. His voice was low. Maybe he smoked, who knows, but as he said those words, I took a step back in fear. There was something off about him. I could sense it. I quickly turned around and went straight to the place where we stored our slices of pizza. We only had pepperoni and cheese, so I decided to heat up that first slice. That's the one I wouldn't have gotten for myself. A minute passed and I was already at his table, shaking in my boots, metaphorically speaking, as I was wearing Chuck Taylors. As I went to put the plate in front of him, that big hand with the snake tattoo grabbed mine. I froze. I didn't know what was going on. What's your name, little girl? The man said while raising his head so we made eye contact. As I stared into his eyes, I felt a sense of terror. That man was up to no good and without even skipping a beat, I tried to get my hand free while screaming, let go. The fact that I screamed didn't seem to bother him. He just smiled, revealing the unhealthiest teeth I'd ever seen in my life. The lady told you to let her go, the elderly man said while seeing that I was in trouble. At the same time, Teddy came from the back hearing all the commotion. Sir, you need to let her go and leave the premises, Teddy told him in an authoritarian tone, but while he kept his distance, the man kept holding my hand for a couple of seconds more and then he let go. See you later, Amy, he said while walking out the door. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. How did he know my name? I started to freak out, but Teddy calmed me down. You have a name tag on, he said. I felt like such a fool for freaking out, but nonetheless, that man let out a bad vibe and he ruined mine as well. Seeing that I was distressed and remembering that the man told me that he would see me later, Teddy offered to drive me home. Come on, it's raining and that creepy dude even gave me the chills. Let me drive you home and make sure you're safe, Teddy kindly said and I was okay with it. The drive wasn't long at all but it seemed to calm me down. I went inside my house before I waved at Teddy and there I was, safe at last, with a tub of ice cream in my lap and browsing Netflix. What to watch, what to watch, I kept saying to myself while whistling some tune I just made up in my head. After settling on a movie title, I got comfy in the couch. All of a sudden, my power went off. Great. It's raining. No one is going to come and fix it. Uh, maybe I can do it myself, I said while getting up and looking for the fuse box. The bad thing was I left my phone at the shop and I didn't have a flashlight in the entire house so I had to improvise and let my vision adapt to the darkness. That didn't work, of course. As I was stumbling on my way back to the fuse box, a strange sound disturbed me. It sounded like the floor creaking. But I was the only one in the house, and the sound came from another room. Now I got scared, and I hid in a dark corner. Amy, come out, little girl. Why didn't you let me eat my pizza? Oh no, it was that creep from the store. I'm definitely going to die, I said to myself as he was slowly walking towards my direction and calling my name while a big knife glistened in the dark, I knew that if I didn't do something, I'm going to die. With each step he took, I remained completely silenced, holding my breath at times. When he got right next to me, I kicked him as hard as I could in his leg, but the man didn't budge. He grabbed me by the hair and he lifted me up. You're a bad girl, Amy, he said while holding the knife inches from my face. The next thing he did was throw me on the ground with such force that I slid into the wall. We'll play a game. You run and if I catch you, I kill you, the murderer said while letting out a creepy laugh. I started running upstairs and he was right behind me. I grabbed a lamp in despair and threw it at his head, breaking it into a million pieces. 
Of course, the man didn't budge, and he continued chasing me. I got into the bedroom, and I locked the door while I screamed. Without even skipping a beat, he kicked the door in. He was so strong, I knew I was doomed. There was nothing I could have done to escape. That was it, my time to die. Walking slowly towards me, he grabbed me by the neck and put the knife right on my neck. Feeling the cold blade and the blood rush to my veins, I closed my eyes, hoping for a miracle. All of a sudden, I could hear something. Amy, it's Teddy. You forgot your phone at the shop. Are you okay? Teddy said. He was downstairs and saw that I had no power, even though the rest of the houses on my block were fine. The man told me to shut up as he guided me out of my bedroom and at the top of the stairs so I could tell Teddy to set the phone on the table and leave. I'm, I'm fine. You can leave the phone and go. I want to go to bed, I said, and Teddy did just that. That was it. My last hope was gone. The man took me downstairs and set me on the couch. How do you want to die, he asked. But before I could say anything, he fell to the ground unconscious. Teddy knew that something was wrong and stuck around, grabbing a baseball bat from his car and hitting the guy on the head. While he was unconscious, we called the police and he was arrested after I told the cops what had happened. Later, I found out that several bodies were at his home and other murders were linked to him. The police officer said that I was very lucky that Teddy stuck around or else the murderer would still be free to this day and I wouldn't have been here. Okay, I don't think you guys are even going to believe this story, but it's 100% true. Just happened last week. I don't know how else I could even preface this dumpster fire of a story, but here it goes. I'm a 22-year-old male, and I live with my fiancé. We had a nice apartment, but we were really looking to buy a house. I know, a little young for that, but we both landed really nice jobs after college and figured that it's better to get it out of the way now and start settling down. We're kind of old-fashioned like that. My fiancé's grandmother owns a home and no one lives in it. She had it for about a year since a family relative passed away. No one wanted anything to do with it since there was a lot of work that needed to be done, like painting the walls and redoing the floors and just various tasks like that. It wasn't completely horrible inside, but there was enough work that it literally sat there for a good little while. Well, my fiancé and I started talking to her grandmother after buying the place. She told us that she would sell it to us for a low enough price that we would be able to afford all of the renovations and whatnot. We were really excited about it. It was really exciting to think we were going to have purchased our first home together so shortly after graduating from college. But here was the problem. She had a lot of people in her family who started feeling left out. It was my fiancé's aunt and her two sons. Their father had died shortly after the second son was born and... The mother had a hard time coping with everything. She was a regular drinker and arguably an alcoholic. My fiancé told me that they were extremely negative people and after meeting them a few times at family functions, I was surprised at how right she was. They lived in government housing. She collected disability fraudulently and her two sons didn't work, despite one being 24 and the other being 19. There were whispers of drug abuse in there too. Suffice to know that these were not the kind of people you wanted to associate with. When word got out that we were buying the house from her grandma, they started feeling really left out. There were a few occasions where they'd try offering to watch the house, very obviously an attempt to get in there and do God only knows what. We politely declined and did everything we could to avoid them. I happened to be at the house one day. My fiancé was working and I work remotely online, so I was home alone. I had just walked down the street to buy a lemonade when I saw someone at her house. It was extremely unexpected. I got ready to confront a potential burglar when I noticed it was my fiancé's cousin trying to break in. He was startled when he saw me and froze for a minute. I asked him what he was doing and he told me something about thinking he saw a car he didn't recognize in the driveway. I explained that it was my car and he left without any big confrontation. As he walked away though I heard him start cursing under his breath. This was the point when I started feeling like we had something to worry about. Not feeling unsafe inside your own home is the worst feeling ever, especially being two young recent college graduates. We both worked really hard to make this happen 
and the idea that it made us feel unsafe there really bothered us. I still didn't even understand what they wanted out of the whole ordeal. They didn't have enough money to afford the property tax alone. Forget about utilities and anything else. About two weeks went by without any kind of confrontation. I had falsely convinced myself that they'd finally leave us alone. I was dead wrong. We went to McDonald's one day, exactly one week ago today, the day I'm writing this. Me and my fiancé both just wanted to be out of the house for a little while. Considering we were in the process of buying a house, we didn't want to go eat anywhere expensive, so McDonald's just seemed like a logical decision. Now before I continue, I feel the need to explain something about my fiancé and I. We are normally very serious people. We work very hard and we're both kind of workaholics, but when we get together to have some fun, we go hard. Work hard, play hard, right? Well, we got kind of silly when we played. Let me cut to the chase. We were both playing in the ball pit at our local McDonald's. We always enjoyed goofing off like that, and we weren't too concerned with what people would think of us. We'd only been messing around for five minutes when her cousin showed up at McDonald's too. It was creepy. He walked right in, looked at us the entire time. Before he even opened the front door, his eyes were stuck on us, and they felt heavy. My fiancé immediately knew something was wrong when my facial expression changed and she darted around to see what I was looking at. We both watched as her cousin made his way out to the ball pit. He stepped outside. As he walked, he moved his body to grab something out of his pocket. I couldn't see what it was, but my first thought was a gun or a knife. The look in his eyes told me he was out to do serious harm. He jumped into the ball pit in my direction. I luckily landed one solid punch in his face as he came down. It threw him off. I had an advantage. He kicked me in the stomach, but I landed a few more punches on his face. He started screaming for me to stop and that I was killing him. I would have kept going if my fiancé hadn't been watching. He started this, not me. We got out of the ball pit. He then began telling us that he was going to press charges on me for assaulting him. I wasn't even phased by this. There were plenty of witnesses there that had seen the whole thing transpire. I started telling him that I was calling the cops and I was going to press charges on him. He got really panicked and ran back to his car and drove off. I'm not going to lie to you. This whole thing really shook me up. I didn't know what to think. I didn't know what to do. I looked around online and found an easy solution. A restraining order. My fiancé and I had both gotten restraining orders on her aunt and her two cousins. I didn't know why we didn't think of this sooner. They really solved the issue and once they understood that we had a restraining order against them, they buggered right off. I haven't seen or heard from them since. And thankfully, and hopefully, that's the end of my story. Many students across the years at my school have often spread rumors about weird teachers. Well, the truth is that most of them were completely harmless. But having an odd stare, a freaky smile, or even talking to the wrong student was enough to have them deemed as creepy by the cohort of students at my school. They were usually just a select few who would pretty much gossip about anyone and everyone. But when it came to teachers, huh, they didn't hold back. There had even been cases of teachers getting fired because of the rumors. Teachers who my older brother had been taught by years ago, saying they were some of the most wonderful people he had ever met. Or so they had appeared. The problem with repeatedly getting teachers fired without reason was that when a teacher joined the school who had actual issues, the school would likely ignore any further complaints about them, believing all the students to be spreading more rumors just for the sake of getting the teachers fired. This exact problem had happened to my year. A year that had only just escaped from lockdown, and we were returning to a school we'd never been in before. Yet, we'd been a part of it for a full academic year now. We were far too naive to be able to distinguish between teachers, which made identifying them difficult, making the first few weeks back a struggle. But after a while, we became used to them, and them to us. And in one case in particular, far too close. Morning, everybody. 
My English teacher, Miss Hart, a woman of around 27 years of age, only a few years out of uni and fresh out of teacher training, was doing her usual morning greeting. "'Morning, Miss!' we all shouted back. There was a general clamor of excitement, as Miss had told us the day before that we were getting a new assistant to replace the old one which had left due to his son getting cancer. A horrific situation for such a kind man that he had been to us. "'Our new teaching assistant arrives today. Are you all excited?' Her cheerful tone delighted the class, and our faces twisted into smiles of joy as we all cocked our heads towards the door, ready to see the new T.A. As we turned around to face the door, there were a couple of shocked gasps as many snapped their necks away from the door to face a man, sat at a desk in the far right, his glass tinted with the blue light flashing from his screen. He noticed us all looking at him immediately, and lifted his head up to sink with his eyes. He bore no expression of a smile as he looked around the room, until his eyes fell on me. His solemn face suddenly morphed into a rather sadistic smile that stabbed into me like one tectonic needle piercing through my heart. Good morning. I look forward to working closely with you. Even Miss Hart was slightly creeped out by his estranged movement and seismic glare as he seemed to be directing his words only towards me. I was petrified, and it wasn't long before the terror escalated and Mr. Hollard grew near. Morning, Harry. How'd you sleep last night? It had been around five days since his appearance in the classroom, and since then he had consistently sat as close as he could to me in every lesson with many lessons that came after break being sat down next to my seat, cutting me off from my friends, leaving me no choice but to sit next to him. He would plague me at first with questions about how I found the school, but then soon enough those questions began devolving into far more personal ones. It was good, thanks. I responded to one of his ominous queries with haste and straightened my neck out to face towards Miss Hart who was beginning the lesson. Around ten minutes in, the moment we were given tasks to do the remainder for the first half of the lesson, he pounced once again. So, Harry, got any plans this weekend? His voice was incessantly beginning to sound almost intimidating as he peered down at my page, edging closer, pretending to examine my work. I'm busy all weekend with my dad and brother. We're going clay pigeon shooting. That ought to scare him off, I thought. Oh, how fun. Bring me back some shrapnel, will ya? He chuckled to himself for a moment, and then engaged his glare once more at my quivering eyes. I subtly nodded and tried to hold my focus to my work, doing my best to avoid eye contact with this creature of a man staring into my soul. You want to know what I'm up to this weekend? He stared at me his mouth slightly ajar, waiting for my response with a foul grin. No, sir. I tried to reply plainly so he wouldn't delve into too much detail. I probably shouldn't have spoken at all. I'm going hunting. Yep. Me, my shotgun, and whatever damned creature finds itself in my way. I shivered at his disgusting habit. He wouldn't shut up about how much he enjoyed hunting hiding from prey before pouncing, and most of all, he wouldn't stop discussing his 12-gauge shotgun. Hey, you wanna see the shotgun? It's a real beauty. I have it in my car. Following my instinct, I sprang up from my seat and beckoned this to let me leave for the toilet. I needed to get away from that freak. I had had enough of it. I swiftly made my way to the bathroom opposite and found a cubicle for me to sit down and try to take a few deep breaths before going back out and having to listen to that vile beast heckle into my ear about his guns, his hunting, his delirious lifestyle. My blood froze as I heard the door open with a loud slam coming from the door smashing into the wall. Harry, I know you're in here. Come with me, I want to show you how oh, awesome my cool gun is. My nerves seized up in seconds, and I reactively hoisted my legs up off the floor so he couldn't spot them from beneath the stall doors. Harry, I'm getting impatient. Come out quickly before Miz realizes we aren't going to the toilet. 
I was utterly stricken with terror at this point, and I certainly wasn't going to leave anytime soon unless he left me be. I heard footsteps slowly approach the cubicle door. It was him, that creature had come for me. And now, a thin plastic door was all that held him back from me. His heavy breathing indicated that he was ready to break his way in if he needed to. Harry, I said come out. Please, can Mr. Hollard come to the head's office now? The speakers boomed down the corridors and through the closed bathroom door. Had I been saved? I'll be right back, Harry. Don't you dare leave now. <laughs> he laughed maniacally as he exited the room. And hearing the bathroom door close once more, I launched myself out of the cubicle and returned back to Miss Hart's class, far too afraid to try and speak out about what had just happened in fear I would be deemed a liar. All because of the rumors spread around by the years before us. Some god must have been watching over me, however, as the next day I came into class and Mr. Hollard was nowhere to be seen. And the same happened the next day, and the day after, and so on until it finally clocked that Mr. Hollard was gone. Whatever had gone down in the head's office, I will never know, but it saved me from whatever twisted plot he'd been using on me to try and get me to his car. I was terrified, but not yet scarred though I never dared to interact with another member of staff I hadn't known for the rest of school. Even now, age 30, and I still can't even fathom talking to someone new, even at work. I would be too cautious. I wouldn't let anyone else come so uncomfortably close to me again. I wouldn't risk it. I'm too afraid. Welcome. This will be where you two are going to stay for the next couple of days. We have amazing activities planned for you. Hope you're excited. Please, go take a look at your rooms and see what you think. You're over at Cabin 4. See you soon. Marquez, our host, returned to the staff shack, and my wife Elizabeth and I were left to explore our accommodation. Wow, it's beautiful, isn't it, Mark? You really paid for the whole thing? I felt slightly insulted by Elizabeth's remark, but considering just how poor we were, it wasn't a surprise she had expected a worse-off honeymoon. Luckily for the two of us, this place popped up as I was searching for honeymoon destinations abroad, and the prices were dirt cheap. It was strange that they were that cheap, considering how luxurious the place appeared to be. The accommodation was located on one of the islands under the Solomon Islands area. The sea reflected the pure blue in the sky, and the water was clear enough to see the bottom only whilst on the shoreline. We were staying on some kind of pier further out into the sea. On the pier, there was a ring of cabins all around one large opening into the sea in the middle, and each of our cabins had a stairway leading down into the depths. Now, personally, I was marginally afraid of the sea. If you can't see the bottom, then how are you supposed to know what's down there? I pushed aside my fears for Beth. She grew up on a British coastal town, so the sea was like a second home to her, hence the reason why she loved the place so much. Haha, <laughs> don't worry, honey, I got us a special deal on the place, so money doesn't matter. Let's go look inside, shall we? She nodded eagerly and leaned in to kiss me. She giggled after and headed inside. I followed, mesmerized by both the cabin's beauty and Beth's. Oh my, Mark! There's a back porch that has a stairway leading into the sea. That's so exciting. I'll be sure to go for a swim later tonight. I walked over towards her, admiring the crystal white bed covered in roses, with the rest of the cabin being covered in lavish furniture. Even a TV sat on the wall. I had no clue how they had any wires come out here, but however so, it was impressive for such a small price. Dear Lord, you can't even see the bottom, Beth. What if something's down there? I was shivering a little at the thought of something lurking beneath the wooden stairwell, waiting for a pair of legs to grace the platform, ready for whatever it was to latch on and devour them whole. Oh, don't be so silly, Mark. There aren't any sharks for another three miles out to sea. And sharks don't bother to come near resorts like this anyway, considering they hunt sharks around here. Her retort set me straight for a moment. Fine. 
But if you see a fin, get out immediately. And if you do go in the water, just let me know so I can come check on you. I was worried about her. We only got married three days ago. I certainly didn't want to lose my wife within the first week of our marriage. Maybe. We'll be together most of the time anyway, so it won't matter. Now I'm hungry. Let's go eat, she said as we made our way outside the cabin, off towards the staff cabin to ask about food. On our way, I looked at the circle opening to the sea in the center of the cabins. It had a slight tint of red in it, and the water was only clear for a couple of meters before cutting off into the murky depths below. I was incredibly nerved by it, but hunger was our focus, so I snapped back into reality. Hey, Marquez, we just came to ask about the food situation. Do we have to wait until dinner, or is there something we can eat now? Her eyes were lit up with hopefulness. Ah, sorry, Mrs. Rochester. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner are the only times food served. But luckily for you, dinner here is at five every day, so give us ten minutes or so, and it'll be delivered straight to your shack. Beth leaped into the air out of joy, and we thanked Marquez, then returned to our cabin awaiting the food. What do you think it'll be, Mark? Beth asked me excitedly. Well, as long as it's food, I don't care too much, but I have a feeling it'll be seafood. She chuckled momentarily as we sat down on the little table and chairs inside our cabin and awaited our food nervously. We spoke for ten minutes before finally hearing a knock on our cabin door. We opened it, and a staff member stood there bearing two plates with a bowl on each. He handed them to us and said, Shark fin soup! Enjoy! He left immediately, and we sat down to eat. I've never had shark fin soup before, Beth stated as she picked up her spoon and began downing the liquid. Neither have I. I don't like the sound of it, I said as I also began digging in. It wasn't terrible, but hearing how hunting sharks attracted more sharks inland towards the coasts, it terrified me. We didn't take long to eat. It was a thick substance, which made it easier to consume. And soon enough, we had left our empty bowls outside, ready to be collected, and both feeling tired. We hit the bed for a nap. I woke up hearing the sound of a scream from outside the cabin. I sat up looking around me wildly for Beth. Her side of the bed had its covers flung off, and there was no sign of her anywhere around the cabin. The scream continued, and so I leapt out of bed, sprinting out the back of the cabin onto the porch to find where the screaming was coming from. It was pitch black outside, with the remaining bits of sunlight being sucked behind the horizon. There were few lights dotted around the area, but there was enough light to see a velvet red liquid pool around the stairwell leading into the sea. No. Beth. Blood and water. Nighttime. Sharks! Suddenly, the scream once again arose from the water, and I could see Beth splashing around, screeching for help. I grabbed her arm and tried hoisting her up at first, but whatever great beast was pulling her from below restricted me from hauling her out. All of a sudden, the door behind me burst open, and in rushed Marquez, followed by several staff members who had heard the screams and had come to help. Two of the staff members fortunately held harpoon guns and dove into the depths below. There was a moment of struggle as Beth wailed in agony. But then, the resistance below had suddenly stopped, and we finally plucked Beth out of the water, though only what remained of her. Her entire left leg had been ripped off, and her right was badly wounded, with several teeth marks lining her calf and thigh. Marquez beckoned for one of the staff members to go and call some kind of ambulance service, which they did, and in 15 minutes a boat arrived at the docking area and Beth's mauled body was hauled aboard. I went with her, and we arrived at a small local hospital after 30 minutes or so of sailing. I held her palm in mine tightly, clutching onto her very life essence. You'll be okay, Beth, I promise! I followed her inside the hospital, but was restricted from entering the surgical room. There was a short period of time where I was stationed alone in the waiting room. And to my foul despair, the doctor came out and spoke the words I can never forget. I'm sorry, sir. She's dead. 